from Altrix Group. Uh, welcome on board, Vishal. We are just arranging the screen to be yours now. And if you can share your screen, please, and introduce yourself. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, yes. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Vishal. I've been at Alteryx for around three years now, um, right now, focusing on technical product marketing. Uh, it's been an interesting couple of years with Alteryx, and I think the last couple of um, the last couple of years have, have actually been a, a big change and a big deviation for how companies are actually starting to look at data and how they're actually starting to democratize. And by being able to sit down with our customers, potential customers and partners, We've been able to really start to, to map out what the different stages of analytic maturity looks like, but more importantly, how you can actually grow through that different stage of, of analytic maturity and really start to give access to people and, and to let people actually be able to make insights from the data rather than segre uh, segregated groups. So, you might be familiar with the International Institute of Analytics or, or the IAA, and they've essentially created this really fascinating five stage model, which looks and assesses at the different levels of analytic maturity for different companies. And so essentially, this is a good roadmap to see where you are in comparison to, to your competitors, to other companies that you're aspiring to be like, uh, and really the sort of insights that you can start to expect turns out that the average score that's actually given to, to these enterprises, and they, they, they did a study of a couple of thousand companies, is around 2.2. And the funny thing is, if you ask someone how analytic, uh, analytically mature they are, chances are that they're going to say around the stage three to stage four area. But the reality is, with a score of 2.2, you do have pockets of analytics within different companies that may be at stage four or even stage five, but then you've also got other departments which may be at stage one. And so you could have someone, for example, a tax professional or a marketing operations expert, and they're going to be very good at the type of insights that they do. They're going to be very able to go ahead and, and really execute on that domain knowledge that they have. But when it comes to actually asking more data-driven questions, that's really where things start to fall over. And so with that, what we're also starting to see is that pretty much all companies want to actually move up that analytic maturity curve. And there's a lot of investment being done, especially in the areas of analytics and data science. Uh, personally, I'm not sure who the 1% of companies who aren't investing in analytics are, but I'm pretty sure that you know, every single company today has some sort of data-driven initiative and, and spend towards that. So that could be everything from building data lakes, implementing data and analytic governance, having more automation, and other digital transformation initiatives. And the issue, though, is that a lot of the time, what's actually being reported and what companies are really using as benchmarks for success are actually tied up with low-level data janitorial services. So in essence, this means that you're seeing a lot more stress and a lot more um, uh, emphasis being put on actually delivering results. So what is that time to value? How do you actually start to free up the people who are actually performing a lot of these key analytic functions? And how do you actually start to increase the number of different insights you're getting and be able to actually become that true data-driven company? And so I think this uh, avocado says it all, to be honest with you. Uh, there's, there's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Um, but we're seeing that companies are spending so much time and effort in organizing, preparing, and actually cleaning their data that once it's actually done, there's not a lot of time left over for actual decision making and, and to actually start to interrogate the different pieces of insights that you're seeing and also starting to really analyze the trends. And I think a big reason for this is a growing divide between people and technology. Because what we see is that in most companies, they've got a small number of really highly analytic individuals. So these are your data scientists, your advanced IT developers. And these people can perform really in-depth levels of analytics. Some of the stuff that they can actually start to build is absolutely amazing, utilizing 
the latest py uh, Python packages, for example, things like um, image recognition or, or really in-depth sentiment analysis. But then you've also got everyone else. So your accountants, your tax professionals, your marketing analysis, um, analysts, sorry, your engineers, and they have a lot of different questions. So things like, why did our sales drop last quarter? What about our inventory? Have we got enough stock on hand to come up for the, the festive period? Or how do we actually start to automate some of these? And there's a, there's a clear definition and a clear understanding that we simply don't have enough data scientists in the world today to actually go ahead and service all these requests. But even if they were, what typically happens is that the knowledge worker or, or the, the domain expert will have a question and they will essentially throw it over the wall. And typically this goes in, this, in, the, um, in the format of a, of a template. So someone would type up a, a, a spec to say, this is what I'm looking to, to answer. So I wanna know why my sales dipped last month. Throw it over the wall to the data science team. And even if the, the, the model is, is uh, built to, to perfect specifications, the chances are that the knowledge worker is going to turn around and say, well, if the data looks like this, then perhaps I asked the wrong question. And then you end up going back and forth. So very much like the, uh, the waterfall methodology, where you're simply going down and, and repeating the process over and over again. And a lot of the time you do end up missing on key domain knowledge. So if a tax professional is asking a particular question, they may assume that the other teams also know what it is that, that they, they are asking for. And they may also be a lot of stuff that's actually missed in communication, which leads to incorrect models. And it, it leads to a lot of frustration, if, if I'm being completely honest. So along with the significant investment that has been made in data science and analytics, there's a huge and, and growing uh, analytics divide. And, and it's creating a huge number of different issues. And without actually having the knowledge workers or, or the domain experts in the data itself with the ability to actually start to explore different data sets, it's unlikely that we're able to actually start to bridge this divide. So what a lot of companies start to develop to eliminate this type of challenge is to create a center of excellence or a COE. Uh, for those who may not know, a COE is essentially a team which is comprised of highly skilled workers. Um, and their job is to essentially disseminate and, and share knowledge and best practices in an assigned sphere of expertise within a specific field of technology, process, or business. So it's essentially a team that works across different business units or product lines within a business unit. So for example, your BI teams who sit in IT or your BI teams who sit in marketing or wherever they may be. The issue though, is that the typical CUE model has actually been uh, reviewed by the Harvard Business Review. And quite shockingly, 0% of companies that work in this model are actually sending analytic requests to a centralized team and, and are happy with it. And so while this study is centered on the frustrations of data science teams, to be clear, the Harvard study found that no one is happy, not the, the knowledge workers or the domain experts or the analytic teams. So it's a common model as data science investments are being made, but the fact of the matter is it, it just simply doesn't work. Now I've seen a, a lot of low satisfaction ratings before, but 0% uh, is, is pretty conclusive and, and it's quite an unfortunate outcome. And some people believe that the way to actually start to correct this type of thing and the way to actually go ahead and rectify and, and fix these types of mistakes is by upskilling knowledge workers and training them to become data scientists. So the amount of times that I've, I've been in meetings and, and speaking to customers and people have said, yeah, we're going to send all of our, our accountants on a Python course and we're going to get them to use um, Jupyter Notebook because that's what all the data scientists use. The hope here is that everyone will then start leveraging all the different pieces of technology that are in place. And all of these technologies typically tend to be geared towards in-depth data science. And this ends up being quite problematic on a couple of different fronts. And, and this is coming directly from 
case studies and customers that we've been working with. And, and the, the reality is that the accountant or the domain expert doesn't typically want to be a data scientist. They have been training and they've been in their field for so many years. Now they're, they're typically quite happy with what they do and they're very good at it. And also the tools that they are using aren't really geared towards the typical knowledge worker. And this results in low satisfaction ratings and pretty much no adoption of these tools as well. So essentially you end up spending a lot of resources, a lot of time and also a lot of money on sending people on these types of courses and, and teaching everyone to use uh, Python and how you can start coding, but people just don't want to do it and, and fair play. So how do we actually start to, to look at that? Because the core challenge isn't that companies are unwilling to invest because we know that they are. But the issue is that we're seeing a lot of companies investing significant amounts of money on the, the few. So for example, the, the data science teams or the developer teams. We're seeing millions being spent on cybersecurity centers for, for the few or advanced master data management solutions that are again, typically only used by a small number of people. We've seen data lakes costing millions to only be set up and a fraction of the actual people who should be using them are actually going into them. Typically, we're seeing people rely on good old spreadsheets. At the same time though, there's also very little resource invested in the majority of the workforce. And so these people tend to typically have that 30 year old spreadsheet, which no one's allowed to, to touch certain tabs on. And you have to be very careful to make sure that you've dragged down the formulas correctly and then all the dates are formatted because it's the most advanced analytic tool that they actually have. So our point of view is that this is the key leverage point. This is how the best companies are accelerating their digital transformation, because what they're doing is that they're balancing their portfolio and ensuring that they raise the capabilities of the knowledge workers, but by providing them with the right tools that they need to actually advance on the analytic journey. And so the enablement of these different workers, uh, knowledge workers, sorry, is what we define as democratizing analytics. And so in the end, uh, companies have a choice on how much effort, resource, and dollars that they're gonna invest in democratizing analytics versus having point solutions and projects that centralized teams effectively take on. And so while the the role of data science and data scientists will likely work on some and especially the most complex and important challenges. The hope is that companies will actually start to save a large parts of money um, because instead of having one or two big bank projects a year, you're gonna end up actually seeing a lot more return on investment per uh, knowledge worker. So you're gonna start to see uh, almost like a trickle effect where Everyone is starting to produce better insight. Everyone's being upskilled, but no one is actually being left behind. And analysts in the company, again, will be continuing to work on these smaller like, big bang projects, but you're gonna end up having thousands of them with the value on this side being eventually larger than the, the, big, uh, sorry, the big projects of, uh, that, you, that you're seeing on, on the left-hand side of your screen. So what I'm really saying is by upskilling the domain experts, asking better questions, and essentially having more projects is what you're actually gonna uh, see when you start to really democratize data. And that's what we're seeing uh, in, in the best of class companies. So companies who are really accelerating progress in their analytic maturity are investing on both sides. So if you invest 90% of your resources to the left-hand side or 90% on the right-hand side, you simply won't get the same benefit of a company who's more balanced. And so whether it's 50-50 or 40-60 left to right or, or whatever it may be, really depends on where you are as a company and where you actually want to go. But the key takeaway here is, is that balance is certainly key. Unfortunately, there is no one set answer because the distribution really depends on, on the situation. So I wanted to change gears a little bit and, and really show you what does 
this actually look like? And how can we take a process and make it in a way that will allow a domain expert to actually start to develop their own models? And, and how do we give them the right tools to actually be able to start creating their own insight? So I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, Alteryx Designer and walk through that with you all now. So for those of you who um, may not have seen Alteryx before, this is what it looks like. Um, essentially, in the middle, you've got uh, a big area that we call the canvas, where you can start to drag and drop different blocks from the top to create your own analytic process. We've sectioned out a lot of the different capabilities by these little tabs. So for example, if I want to input data, or I can go to in, in and out. If I want to prepare or clean that data, or I can do preparation. But we can even start to do things like machine learning by simply dragging and dropping different blocks. We don't need to code, and we can actually be guided through an entire model build process. So with democratizing data, the first piece of that is really to be able to access the data wherever it lives. We're seeing that data is shared across companies in spreadsheets, it's shared across in um, XML, and in, in sometimes even uh, HTML, uh, but most and, and more frequently, actually through different databases, so on cloud or on-prem. So if I want to go ahead and connect to a data source, all I need to do is drag and drop this input data block. I can then simply click and point and choose what file type I want to connect to. So if I wanted to connect to a spreadsheet or if I wanted to connect to a JSON file or whatever it may be, I can simply go ahead and do that. Or if I wanted to go ahead and connect to a data source, I can go ahead and connect, let's say, to my IBM database or for Oracle or Snowflake, wherever it may be. In this example, um, I've got a nice spreadsheet that I'm going to connect to, which has got my customer information on it. You'll see that we've got a preview of our data on the left-hand side, but if I actually want to pull in all this data, all I need to do is hit this run button. And so this is going to go ahead, read that file in, and show me all the different rows and columns of my data set straight away. So as a, an analyst or someone actually looking into this data, you might want to start to understand trends. And you might want to understand, for example, this responder column of who is actually responding to our marketing campaigns. Because ultimately what I want to do is I want to try to predict who is going to respond to a new marketing campaign. And can I use this data to help me make that prediction? Well, the first part with any data project is also once you've got the data to actually take a look and, and investigate those types of trends. So we made it very easy to actually go ahead and browse or, or view that data. So when I drag and drop, you'll see that these blocks connect together. And so all of the different processes run from left to right. So I can see here I'm reading my data in, and then here I'll be able to then see the different trends in my data set. So for example, if I click on customer segment, I can see that I've got four different segments within my data set. I can even start to see some stats around that. So 35% of my uh, data is actually composed of my large customers. And then I've got 23% of small customers uh, and so on. If I go to responder, I can also see, well, most of the people, 83, just shy of 84%, uh, are actually not responding to my marketing emails uh, with only 16% of people who actually are. So without actually doing anything, <laughs> just by simply dragging and dropping a browse, I'm very quickly and easily able to start actually dissecting this information and, and really making sure that my data set is one, accurate, but also being able to tell the story behind the data as well. So I wanna actually provide another data set as well, because I wanna also take a look into see the different transactions that are being made by all of these different customers. So if I want to add my second source of data, same as before, I can simply drag and drop this input data block, and I can go ahead and connect this time to my transactions. I'll just add another browse, so we can just interrogate that data set as well. And here I can see all the different transactions that are being made by all of my different customers. If I click on sales, as it's a numeric column, I'm also going to start to see a bit of different type of information. So for example, what the maximum value is, what the minimum. And so I can straight away see from this data set with this grouped values that 
97% of my data actually lives between 1 and 6,675. So each transaction people are making is somewhere within that bracket 97% of the time. I do also have one huge outlier over here. And we can actually see because there's such a big spread between my max and my minimum, we're actually seeing a huge variance in my data set as well. So it's very quick and easy to start to understand your data, validate your data, and also figure out the hidden insights that your data is actually telling you. So what if you wanted to start to, to transform this data? Every single time that um, I've been with a customer, we're doing some sort of data task. The data is never in the format that you want it to be in. So how do you actually go ahead and put it in the format you want? Well, you simply drag and drop. So for example, here, I've got all the different transactions that all my different customers are making. So six transactions, I think that's it, six or seven made by customer number three. Well, what if I just wanted to see what the total transactions were? I can simply go to my summarize and actually summarize my data set however I want to see it. I simply drag and drop that in. And I can say, I want to see per customer. So group by my customer and I'll figure out the sum of the sales. We'll go ahead and count how many times our customer appears as well. So what that's gonna give me is I can now see for all my different customers, the total amount that they're actually spending with me, but also how many times that they've actually made a transaction as well. And so one of the other things that happens quite often when it comes to democratizing data and when it comes to actually explaining data is that this mess, the, the actual process of going from raw data to insight becomes quite difficult to explain. And I've, had, I've been in meetings before where you're sitting down at the table and people have got the same number, but completely different ways of actually calculating it, or even worse, having the same type of report, but all with different numbers and no one knows who's right. So the nice thing about having this type of interface is that we can straight away go through to see directly at the source of, data, uh, source of the data, what it looked like. We can see what was done to that data and what it looks like after that transformation has been made. And we can step through this and have that full audit trail and that full, let's say, governance layer to really be able to understand the exact process that's actually happening to, to go from data to insight. Brilliant. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to take this, my summarized sales data, and I want to essentially blend it with my, my customer's um, CRM data. So here's typically in SQL or SQL where you'd use a join. In a spreadsheet, you'd use a VLOOKUP. Uh, in Alteryx, we can just drag and drop. So I can drag and drop this guy in. I can connect both sides up. And I just choose what it is that I want to join on. So I can, in this case, I've got customer ID as my, my common field. So I can say, I want to join where the customer ID is equal to the customer ID. So now when I run this, it's gonna take my data set, it's gonna do that data transformation, and it's also now gonna show me for all my different customers what their actual sales volume, uh, sales amounts, and, and the number of transactions they've made are as well. So this is a, a very typical case where, we, where we're seeing with customers all the time. We, they just wanna be able to do some sort of calculations, they wanna be able to do some sort of data aggregations, and then, um, join them. But the, one of the, the key areas is actually also to be able to reconcile data as well. So it's great that all of these matched, but what happens if there's a customer who's never made a transaction? Or what if there's transactions that are being made, but we don't know who that customer is? How can we get visibility and insight into that? Well, the nice thing is you'll notice that this join block is different from the rest in the sense that it's got three different outputs. So the J shows me everything that's joined. If I click on this L, it will show me that I have no records because what it's doing is it's looking between both of my different data sets and anything which exists in this but doesn't exist here will appear in this L. So it does that reconciliation for me. Similarly, if I click on the right-hand side or the R, I can see I've got 25 records, 
So these are 25 different customers, some of which are actually spending quite a number, uh, well, making quite a number of transactions. This person spent over just shy of uh, $34,000, but I have no idea who this customer is. And so by being able to very quickly understand and reconcile data, it makes it faster than ever to actually interrogate that data. And if I wanted to then start generating automated reports, for example, or even simple things like sending an email, I can simply drag and drop so that every time this process runs, I can actually go ahead and get that email sent out to whoever it is that needs to see it. I'll just delete this for now. And when we look at this type of data, we've got to the stage where we've got our two inputs, we've done some, some summarizations, and then we've done our join as well. With a trend as well of data democratization, being able to actually start to dive in to do things like model building without having to essentially code or take training courses and, and deep dive into the fundamentals of data science and, and data science uh, topics. What we try to do is really augment the ability to use these types of machine learning models, but make it available to people who don't have that background. So a good example of this is actually within our machine learning blocks. So we've got something called assisted modeling. So if I drag and drop that in, what the assisted modeling does is it lets people be guided through the entire model build process. So everything from choosing what type of model to use, how to actually evaluate the model, as well as model explainability is all done in a way that you don't need to have that degree in statistics to understand what's happening behind the scenes. It's also not a black box. So you are able to actually see if, if you'd like to, as from the data science perspective, the, the Python code that is being generated by all the different clicks, you can actually have full visibility into that as well. So it's as code free or as code friendly uh, as you'd like it to be. So I'll go ahead and click start assisted modeling because what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict who's actually likely to respond to our next marketing campaign. So this should uh, right now, there we go. We can just go ahead and click start building. So the first thing it's gonna ask me to do is it's gonna ask us, what is it that we want to predict? So it's going through our data set and it's gonna to suggest to us all the different columns and ask us which is the column that you're trying to predict. So if I wanted to predict what the sum of sales is likely to be for a particular customer, I can do that. In this case, I wanna actually predict who's actually going to respond to this marketing campaign. So we'll go ahead and click on responder. We'll hit next and we can actually confirm that that is what we'd like to, to predict. And here I can actually choose the type of automation that I'd like to do as well. So do I wanna go through a step-by-step -step process or would I like to automatically have the, the model built for me? So in our case, I will like, I'll go through step-by-step -step so we can actually see what's happening be, uh, behind the scenes, but it is quite nice to be able to let Alteryx take the wheel and sit back, get a coffee and uh, come back to a fully trained model. So with model building, the first thing that you'd need to do similar to what we did with that browse function is to actually put data into the correct types. So for example, Alteryx is now going in to each of our different columns and it's seeing and suggesting what the data type should be. It's seeing that these customer ID columns, it could be a numeric value, it could be an ID, and it's just asking us to verify it. So in our case, we know their IDs, so we can just go ahead and toggle those. And the same thing for location. This is actually a categorical value. But what if I have no idea what categorical means or numeric means? We've got an inbuilt glossary that shows you contextual uh, definitions for all the different terms that are on the screen. So it will actually give me plain text, very simple uh, and digestible way of knowing what categorical value is or, or a Boolean. So telling you that it can only be one of two things like true or false. Once I'm happy with uh, all of my different data types, I can simply click next. And it's then gonna go through my data to see if I've got any missing values. So missing values when building models can be quite problematic and there's various different ways that you'd actually fix those. So you might impute values, you might 
use a, a constant, you might use uh, the median. And all tricks will actually help guide you through what the right decision for your particular uh, situation is. In this case, we don't actually have any missing data, so we can absolutely go ahead and click on next. And this uh, is, is where things start to get, in my opinion, <laughs> quite cool. So Alteryx is going in and is actually taking a stab at what it thinks that we should use when it comes to making that prediction. It will give you an indicator to tell you if something's a good predictor or, or a bad predictor. And so this is super useful because if something is too highly associated or, or very weakly associated, chances are you don't want to include those in your model. And the glossary will give you a bit more information about that. Um, but for the sake of, of this presentation, um, you essentially don't want to skew your model. So Alteryx is making sure that you are guided through making a, a fit for purpose model and not something which is only going to work on the data the set that it's been trained on. So it, it is really guiding you to make a better choice when it comes to the model build. Once I'm happy with my predictors, I can also deselect any if, if I wanted to. I can go ahead and hit next. And here's where Alteryx is now going to ask me, well, what models do you want us to evaluate? I can choose as many of these as I'd like, but I can also start to see the pros, the cons, a definition of what the model actually does, as well as use cases that we've seen that this model be applied for. So for example, the logistic regression model, it's uh, easy to interpret. However, it's limited to only binary classifications. And some good use cases for those are things like direct marketing campaign response, which is pretty handy because uh, that's a very similar thing to what we're trying to predict as well. So we're trying to predict, is someone going to respond? Yes or no? Once we're happy with, uh, with this, we simply hit run selected algorithms. And all tricks will start running all these different models at the same time and give us a, a, a suggestion on what model it thinks we should use. So, so far it's only completed one of the four. They will start to see more pop up into this leaderboard once they start to be complete. One more to go, perfect. So all tricks are saying that XGBoost is the model that we should use because it's got the best accuracy uh, as well as the best back, uh, balanced accuracy and to be honest, it's best in every, every way. <laughs> uh, it's also going to start giving you things like uh, your ROC chart. And, and actually, again, if, if you're not sure what ROC chart is, it will give you a, a very simple description of how you can actually start to use uh, ROCs. You can also get overviews of your model as well. So this is super, super helpful to really understand because you might have a model that's very accurate but it might be very accurate in one particular thing. So if we take a look at, let's say this confusion matrix, uh, when someone didn't respond to my marketing campaign, it was night, uh, sorry, it was right 97% uh, of the time. When they were someone who did uh, respond, it was right 78% of the time. So not as good as uh, predicting someone who won't, but it's still fairly, fairly good. But it's actually, falsely giving me a, a no 22% of the time when someone actually did respond. And similarly, it's giving me a 3%, so it's a much lower false, uh, false negative, but still that 22% is something that I should definitely take a look at. What does this mean? Well, it allows you to start explaining your model to the key decision makers. It allows you to understand what's actually happening and things to look out for when the model is actually productionized. You can also start to get other insights as well, such as the, the interpretation. So when we're building this model, or let's say we're using this model, one of the questions that I can envisage the business asking is, well, how do we get more people to, to respond? How do we understand why people are responding? What makes someone respond? Well, I can show them this to say, well, the most important things when understanding if someone's going to respond to our, our campaign is really how much that they're actually spending with us. Interestingly, it doesn't matter how many unique things that they're purchasing. So it doesn't matter if they're buying things uh, once or buying things a million times, but the total number of, of cash that they're actually spending is, is the most important. Uh, followed by the, the distance in miles and then the, the drive time. So distance of miles is actually, interestingly, um, more important than how long it takes to, to get that. 
So in essence, what we've been able to do is really be guided through that entire model build process. And now we can actually go ahead and apply this model. So all I need to do is click this box and click add models and continue to workflow. And what this is gonna do is same as before where we were dragging and dropping, this uh, entire process that we've gone through has been created for us behind the scenes. So everything from setting our different data types, actually going ahead and choosing what we want the model to do, doing the model, uh, sorry, the data cleanup, as well as actually applying and training the model has all been built for us. All we need to do is give some data into this predict values icon. So I'm just gonna, for the sake of this example, just use the data I used earlier. And this is gonna score the model. And so what that means is it, it's essentially gonna take my data that I've, I've given it, and it's gonna run the model against all those different values. And it's gonna tell me what the model thinks that person is gonna do. So are they gonna respond to my uh, email campaign or are they gonna tell me to go away? So just let this run. So this shouldn't be, shouldn't take too much longer. Perfect, there we go. I can now see for all my different customers, what does the model think? So it's saying this person, this person, this person, I'm not gonna respond as well as many, many more. However, this person is. So the reason why I think that is because it's saying that the model thinks that it's 66.6% .6 likely to be someone who's actually gonna take the time to, to respond to me. So what I can do from here is I can send this out to, to my marketing teams or whoever needs to know this information so that we don't end up, let's say, spending, um, spending marketing dollars on someone who's not likely to, to uh, respond to us. Let's focus it on the people who are the most likely. So within uh, 10 to 15 minutes, we were able to get some data. We we're able to prepare and blend those two different data sets together, as well as actually build a machine learning model using XG Boost without writing a single line of code and by actually being guided and, and assisted through the entire model build process. So when it comes to actually having the ability to start democratizing data, our experience with our customers has shown that to make this happen at its core, you need to have a change management process. So you need to have strategies and also tactics how you can actually start to drive mass democratization of analytics and fundamentally upskill a significant portion of your workforce. And so there's three steps that lead to best in class democratization. Uh, and they're the basics that you're gonna need to make any change management journey. So first you need to in, really make people aware and tell people and get them excited enough to actually want to invest in training themselves. You're also gonna to need to provide training and, and the right tools for people to actually go on the, uh, the journey. And finally, you actually need to be able to sustain and support them once they're up and running. So this means ongoing support, uh, even things like recognition and having those built into the, the actual process itself. Each of these strategies can really leverage a, a, a whole bunch of different tactics from setting up user groups, having hackathons, uh, demo days to, to reward that recognition and also actually uh, allowing you to start uncovering new analytic use cases from the top and so on. So the good news is, is that there is a recipe to actually start to drive this sort of change management and really deliver rapid results, especially with things like hackathons. Um, some of the, the things that I've seen some companies do by having these types of um, change management processes in place is absolutely amazing. And the, the one pitfall that I would say to try to avoid is simply placing a box of check in a corner and, and suggesting that anyone who wants it can go ahead and, and have a play is probably not going to give you broad democratization of analytics and, and upskilling. So we've done quite a lot of research to, to really create and refine the core best practices of driving analytics um, and, and essentially driving change. And so this, this involves things like actually using things like value engineering. So looking at your different use cases and, and understanding what the actual ROI is for each of those. 
being able to actually have a place where people can ask questions and also being able to really start to, to give people the support they need. I think the, the key here is to let people have fun, <laughs> but also to really um, allow the, the masses to start to, to drive their little use cases and really add up to something big. Uh, Vishal, just one question, sorry to interrupt you. There are many questions for you. Do you like to, because we have five minutes. Yeah, that's brilliant. Timing is okay. perfect. <laughs> so, so if, shall I, shall I open one question? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, Alice, uh, uh, Alicia, I give you uh, camera to start, co-host. Go ahead with your question, please. Introduce yourself and the question, please, Alicia. Yeah, uh, I hope you can see me and you can hear me. Thank you very much for your presentation. My, I have two questions. One question is what you would exactly teach the knowledge workers? Sure. You know, really and the second question, uh, at least three important points. And uh, the second question would be, what are the prerequisites which needs to be fulfilled without having successful self-service of the knowledge workers? Thank you. Sure. Um, so to answer the second question uh, first is, when it comes to prerequisites, um, the way that I've always, I've always looked at it is, if someone can do a, pre, uh, a V lookup, that typically means that they're, they're able to understand the type of thing they want from their data. And it's just about giving them the ability to tap into what is in their brain. So if they understand, okay, I want to be able to look for this value and I want to pull in everything from another source of data that has that value, that, that in my opinion, would be that, that prerequisite. And um, I'm really sorry, could you remind me of the, the first question again, please? What would exactly, what you would teach uh, the knowledge workers because we said sure. you don't want to go to very sophisticated data science obviously so what would be the most important things you would be in the domain of data literacy what you would teach them sure so i think the the number one thing would be to to not be afraid um i think there's a big misconception that you know using data science and, and being able to build models is all very complicated and you need to spend hours in code and statistics and with the use of um, low-code and no-code platforms, it, it's becoming very, very accessible. So I think the first thing is, is to let people experiment. And, and secondly, I think I would, I'd like to show them that there is a better way of doing things. I think a lot of people have been relying on older technologies, which are great for, for what they're designed for, but we've come to a point where we're essentially trying to put a square peg in a round hole a lot of the times especially when we're looking at, you know, huge spreadsheets. I remember I was with a bank once and we were going through one of their, their end of year processes and there was a, a huge spreadsheet that they were using to, to do um, some of their reporting. And they had a 21 page Word document that was accompanying that spreadsheet to highlight exactly the steps they need to do. So they needed to add rows in here and add a few blank columns because someone had once built a macro that then does all sorts of witchcraft and, and the magic. Um, so I think just telling people there is a better way of, of doing things and it doesn't have to be something that you're going to have to spend uh, years and years of your life to, to figure out only to, to go for north. So that's what I would say. Thanks a lot. However, still, uh, Alicia and uh, Vishal, you can reach out together on that LinkedIn group or the chat area so that you can take the communication later on because we have just two minutes. A question from uh, uh, Itoma Igo. Does the tool know how to handle multi culinary culinarity effect of independent variables to the dependent variables? Uh, short answer is, is yes. <laughs> and um, I'd love to, to speak to you more about your specific uh, use case. I'm sure you've got something in mind uh, for, for that question. So yeah, please, please get in touch and then we can, we can talk offline and, and go deeper. Perfect. Thanks a lot. The last question, Harish uh, uh, Kingre, does it support any computer vision models? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that we've we've got in the platform